Hello Mechanical Transmissions class. Uh, this is Travis Bledsoe coming again with another video lecture. We're going to cover fasteners in this section. We'll go ahead and get started into fasteners. Alright, uh, screw threads. Screw threads are have three common uses. Uh, they can be used for measurements, power transmission or as a fastening device and that is how we uh, what we'll talk about in this lecture is how to use them as a fastening device um, measurements you can think of um, with our micrometers that we use uh, as you turn those those have threads inside so we're actually used as a measuring tool in power transmission you can think of like a c-clamp uh, you're transmitting power through that uh, um, clamping device. So we'll get into fastener terms. Here we've got a picture of a bolt. Not all look like this, but uh, many of the heavy hex bolts do. So first we'll see the, the hexagon head um, to the left of that picture. That is where you grip with your wrench. Uh, we have an unthreaded shank on this bolt. Not all bolts are like that. Some are uh, have the threads all the way up to the bottom of the head. And then we see the threads, and we've got different aspects of the threads. The most important parts of the thread, uh, for one, is the thread length, and the most important is the, the pitch, which is the distance between uh, one thread to the next thread. And we'll talk quite a bit about pitch in following slides. So look at the very bottom of that picture. It says the shank or bolt length. So notice that the bolt length of this particular bolt is from the bottom of the head to the end of the bolt. So that is uh, how you measure most screws and most bolts. There are the ones that are countersunk, the flat head cap screws, that you measure from the top of the head. And we'll look at those in some later slides. Just want to point that out. You measure the bolt from the bottom of the head. Actually, the way to think of it is measuring the bolt for whatever recess is down inside of the part that you're putting it in. So if it's a countersunk screw, you're going to countersink it down into the screw and you're going to count the head as part of it. So we'll talk more about that later. Another aspect of this, uh, these bolts is the diameter. So you've got the uh, different diameters. You've got pitch diameter, the um, radius diameter, which is a minor and then you've got your major diameter and so that's what we want to focus on is the actual diameter of the bolt is a major diameter so we have different thread systems throughout the world some are uh, have kind of gone away and been overtaken by the most common which are the unified thread system and the metric thread system there are a few still in use today, uh, the Squire and Acme, uh, mostly the Acme for a general purpose type C-clamps and things like that, that are um, heavy use, heavy duty use. But um, for a thread, uh, for bolts and thread uh, fastening devices, uh, the unified thread system and the metric thread system is what's commonly used around the world today. Mostly the metric is, is the international known uh, thread system. Notice that both have 60 degree uh, between the angles, and then you've got the pitch is one distance from one thread, top of the one thread to the next thread. And we'll talk quite a bit about that today. So thread ter terminology. We've got the thread angle, which is commonly 60 degrees that I just mentioned, and the pitch is defined as a distance from one given point on one thread to the corresponding point on the next thread, which is kind of crest to crest, top to top. That's very important when you're looking for uh, for um, a particular bolt or screw to, to screw into either a nut or into a piece that you you have threaded. You need to know the pitch, the distance that, because it's different for um, different size um, bolts for the different diameters, different uh, 
and metric and standard are different. So we'll get to, we'll talk a little bit more about pitch in the next coming slides. So lead lead is the distance the the thread advances in one revolution. So that can change by your pitch and distance. So here's another a view of uh, how do we look at pitch. So let's look at um, the second picture. So we're looking at a metric bolt, and notice that uh, at the bottom it says metric threads, and right above that little picture it says M10. Anytime you see an M before a number, that is uh, determined as metric. So metric threads actually measure the distance between one thread to the next. That is their pitch. So you'll see that expressed as M10 by 1.5. It's 1.5 millimeters from one thread to the next thread. Now this, the standard version is a little bit different. And we still measure the one thread to the next. However, we measure in a one inch increment. So we can lay a, a scale, a tape measure or a scale down across a, a bolt thread and measure how many threads are within that one inch. And when they express that as TPI or threads per inch. So you can you can use thread pitch gauges, which is shown in the fourth picture, uh, which is an actual gauge that is machined. Uh, it's tight tolerances to fit inside of the um, inside of the threads, and they should all fit in there uniformly with no light uh, shining through or very little light shining shining through. That's shown on the next couple slides here. So determine the thread pitch. You can use a thread pitch gauge uh, for metric threads. For me, it's almost uh, have to to use a thread pitch gauge because they're measuring from one thread to the next. And it's really hard to, to get down into measuring from one thread to the next thread to get exact millimeters. So a thread pitch gauge is very handy. And you can also use those for the, the American standard or the standard version. Um, but it's a little bit easier to measure the, the standard version using a, a ruler. You can just, uh, within a one inch, you can count the number of threads. Um, in that direction or you see the picture at the bottom how they're using a thread pitch gauge it's an actual picture so you notice that all the teeth of the thread pitch gauge engage with the threads of the fastening device there and they fit in uniformly and there's very little light showing through and if it is any light this should be even all the way across um, you can get into some that are very very close but they're not exact The unified screw thread system and metric thread system, as I mentioned, those are the most commonly used today. Um, the unified thread system is is recognized in the United States, Canada, and Great Britain, though it's uh, it is decreasing, has been decreasing decreasing for many years. Um, the metric thread system is an international thread system that is used in all countries uh, to some degree. Uh, still, the, th the standard in our country is the standard or the unified screw thread system. Now let's look at the unified screw thread system. It's broken down into uh, really two categories, but there's a third category for special uh, circumstances. So we've got a unified national course and a unified national fine, and that is the number of threads per inch. So your coarse threads are going to have fewer threads per inch. And the fine threads, of course, are going to have more threads per inch. The Unified National Special is going to be somewhere in between that. Um, so if you've got a coarse thread and a fine thread, they both have pros and cons to those. Um, that's the reason we have both. So if you're creating a device that you know you want, you have certain characteristics of the the bolt that you need, but the fine or the the course doesn't fit that you can have a company create a unified special uh, thread so it may be somewhere in between the fine and the course and that's that's totally unique to the application i just want to mention that in this slide but as we go through we're not going to do any measuring or, or you know, talk much about the unified special because as i said that is a unique to 
particular piece of machinery, an application um, from a manufacturer of some sort. So uh, the standard is the Unified National Course and Unified National Fine. That's what you'll normally find in uh, most applications that have the Unified Screw Thread System. The metric thread system, as I mentioned, is used in all countries. Um, you know, United States, Canada, and Great Britain also recognize the metric thread system because it's it's been used in so many industries, especially the automotive industry. It's basically all converted over to the metric thread system. So we'll look at uh, the unified screw thread system in a little bit more detail here. We've got the diameter and length expressed in inches. Uh, the pitch is exposed, or I'm sorry, exposed, expressed in uh, threads per inch, TPI, threads per inch. And then they're available, of course, in fine and, and coarse threads. Uh, the special being a unique application again. So look at the fourth bullet down. If you've got a bolt that's quarter inch in, in diameter, so your, your major diameter, or just diameter, of the bolt is quarter of an inch, and your length is two inches. So this is actually a, a coarse thread, and I'll show you a chart coming up that shows you uh, what's defined as coarse, what's defined as fine threads uh, for the, the standard United, uh, UNC and standard UNF. So a quarter 20 is your coarse threads, and you're going to express that in. If you look at the, the bullets below that, um, so you've got quarter inch major diameter, 20 is the number of threads per inch, and then you've got two inches the length. You want to express that when you go buy a box of bolts or you go to Lowe's, start looking at the shelf, at the, how it's ex written into their labels. You're going to have a quarter dash 20. That's quarter inch diameter dash 20 threads per inch and an X by two inches long, UNC. You may not always see the UNC, you know, that depends on where you're at, um, what, um, where you're buying from, they may put that on, may not. Um, but a quarter 20 is a very common screw, and it's a, um, the coarse thread. So a quarter inch fine thread is going to be 28 threads per inch. And if you notice at the, the bottom of that little section, we got expressed as a quarter dash 28 by 2 UNF, Unified National Fine. So the coarse threads, here's the pros and cons of coarse versus fine. So the, the most common is your coarse threads. And they're used you know, for mass production of bolts, screws, nuts. That's your most common ones. A quarter 20, like I said, is a very common screw to find an application. The coarse threads have the best resistance to stripping of internal threads in softer materials. So the reason being is because you have more thread engagement with uh, with your coarse threads. If you take your fingers and just stick uh, from your right hand to your left hand and stick your fingers in between the other fingers and try to press them in, that's how those threads are trying to engage. And the coarse threads um, go very deep into uh, each other. They're tall and they go, you know, you probably get 70% engagement with those threads. Your fine threads, um, they don't go as deep, so um, but you've got more of the bolt, more of the threads within an inch uh, distance. So you've got more threads within that area, but they don't engage as deep. So um, that's why the coarse threads have a greater resistance to stripping because your threads are engaged deeper. But the fine threads have better bolt strength. Because when they take a, a ta or a die and cut the threads off of um, off the round stock to make your fine thread bolt, you're not cutting as much uh, as much metal out of the bolts uh, out of the round stock. So your root diameter of your fine thread is going to be larger. So you're actually going to have more. Uh, I use the word meat, I guess, of the um, of the metal in a fine thread bolt. No, the threads do not engage more. You've got a stronger bolt. So you'll find those type of bolts 
like in high strength applications, say like a head bolts on a car, they have to be torqued down very tight and tighten even. So typically those are going to be a fine thread. There'll be long uh, sections of threaded engagement to make sure you have a lot of threads engaged and the bolts are the root diameter is thicker. So this is a picture I just put in this slide deck. Uh, it's kind of show, let me get my mouse going on here. So the quarter 20 we talked about. So here is uh, the quarter 20. Hopefully that's showing up on your screen where I'm circling with the uh, with mouse. So quarter 20, that is your coarse thread. And here below that is the quarter 28. Now this chart is by Starrett and it's a uh, decimal equivalent. It's a tap drill size chart. And we, you should have saw this when we, when we drilled in our first lab. We drilled some holes and kind of looked at the chart and figured out how we, I think it's a 3 8 hole that we drilled and we used a 5 16 um, drill bit. So if you notice, and we was talking about the, the, the thread engagement, notice that for a coarse thread, we're having to drill out the hole more. I'm sorry, with a, drill the hole out less, uh, about to a 1364s. For a fine, we drill it out more, closer to a 732nd. That's because the bolt is actually larger, uh, the root diameter for the quarter 28 than it is the quarter 20. So the metric thread system, the diameter, pitch, and length, they're all expressed in millimeters. So as I mentioned in an earlier slide, if you see an M at the beginning of it, so we can get the mouse in here, so we've got to M10. If you see this M, that's going to designate that it's a metric. So you, you'll know right off when you see M10 or M5 or M12. Uh, that's how it's going to be expressed. So the pitch, as we talked earlier, is the actual distance between two threads, from the peak of one to peak of the other th uh, thread. And it's really hard to measure with a ruler, so that's where the thread pitch gauges come in handy. So there are fine and coarse threads in the metric system as well. I've got a slide right after this that kind of shows the difference in the uh, coarse and fine threads. So our example here, we've got a, a metric screw that's 10 millimeters in diameter, has a pitch of 1.25 millimeters, which is distance between the threads, and the length of it is 20 millimeters long. So the nomenclature, uh, if you find, buy a box of bolts, this is what should be on the side, M10 by 1.25 by 20. So you've got diameter, pitch, and length. Now remember on the the, uh, the standard thread system, they're expressed in the same order. You've got diameter, pitch, length. However, you know, the thread system, as I mentioned, uh, the, uni or the unified thread system is measured threads, uh, t threads per inch, TPI, instead of the actual distance. But in, in order, in the same way, diameter, pitch, length. I kind of stress that because some students get that mixed up on the test. Um, they kind of get confused between the two, but just keep in mind they're expressed both diameter first, the pitch, and then the length. So here's the uh, chart showing the coarse and fine. Look at the ones here in the middle. We've got um, come down to a 10 millimeter. So you've got a coarse thread of 1.5. So that's the distance between one thread to the next. And then the fine is 1 or it could be expressed as a 1.25. And we come into, uh, say, a, a 20 millimeter is a 2.5 as a course, and the distance from for the fine is 1.5. Off the left side, you'll notice that we've got, uh, let's go back to the quarter inch example. Quarter 20 is your course, quarter 28 is the fine thread. This is kind of a repeat of what we just talked about. It's kind of showing, again, the comparison um, of your unified thread system and your metric thread system. 
but you've got your diameter first when it's expressed uh, diameter first uh, your pitch or threads per inch and then the length so most threads are right-handed threads meaning when you turn them on they're going to go clockwise to tighten counterclockwise to loosen uh, the, the common phrase is righty tighty lefty loosey that's referring to right-handed threads there are applications that left-handed threads are used and it's mainly due to the rotation of the application so you want your your rotation um, to actually want to influence tightening of the bolt and the best example to use for, for this uh, example or this um, I guess express this example is um, pedals on a bicycle that's a simple common thing that everybody you know has probably used a bicycle but the, the pedal on the right side has right-handed threads and the pedal on the left side has left-handed threads and it's because as you're pedaling, um, as that rotation goes around, you don't want the force of that rotation, particularly if the bearing starts to get tight inside of the um, side of the pedal. If the bearing starts to get tight, you don't want it to start unscrewing that thread and that uh, pedal from the uh, crankshaft. So they have left-handed threads on the left side, which is going to encourage tightening of the the bolt and then right-handed threads on the right side there are some other applications that's just um, left-handed threads just to be um, to make sure you don't get things mixed up like propane tanks the older style propane tanks with the um, that had the female threads on the inside and you had a hose or adapter had the male threads that went in uh, that's the older style those are those are left-handed threads and it's just so you wouldn't interchange that with another type of um, connector. So we'll look at um, fastener identification, the difference between bolts and screws. Now these are the definitions. For a bolt is an externally threaded fastener that is inserted through holes in an assembly. And the definition for screw, uh, I'm sorry, is an externally threaded yeah, the external threaded fastener that is inserted into a threaded hole and is tightened by turning the head of the screw. So basically a bolt is going to have a nut on it and a screw will not. A screw is going to go into a uh, piece of uh, metal or, or, or an object that has threads already cut into it. I sometimes use the word bolt and screw interchangeably. Um, but uh, that's, that's the actual definition. You know, the externally threaded fastener inserted through holes in the seam will has a, a nut on the back side for bolt. So through uh, screws for maximum threading thread strength, the minimum thread engagement should equal one and a half times the screw diameter. One and a half times the screw diameter. So for a half inch bolt, it should have three quarter of an inch uh, thread engagement to get maximum strength out of it. So carriage bolts, this, we're going to show a lot of different types of bolts after this. We're starting here. So we've got carriage bolt has got a round head on it with a square body underneath the head. These are typically used uh, to fasten wood parts together. So as you, uh, you drill a hole through the wood and as you tighten down and you put the bolt through and then you tighten down the nut and then the, the nut starts pulling the the square head down inside of the wood and that keeps the, the bolt from turning and that way you can tighten the the nut down and because you don't have anything to grip it with on the upper side on the head side another common place you'll see these are like swing sets they're kind of like safety bolts where they have the rounded head so particularly beside of the swings and things they'll have um most uh, well, a lot of the um, swing sets today are, are metal and they'll have metal holes punched in to it or square holes punched in 
to where the the squire underneath the head of the bolt can fit into that squire notch into the into the metal tube of the swing set and then you can tighten the nut down on the opposite side and that way there's there's no exposed head or sharp edges that can cut so these are called carriage bolts so socket head cap screws these are going to be the strongest of all the head designs they're an allen wrench type head hex uh, insert a hex um, tool the height of the head is equal to the shank diameter so we've got the low head cap screw shown at the bottom uh, which is you know the similar as the socket head cap screw they're just not as strong just the head is, is smaller same use the allen wrench to, to tighten those or loosen those the flat head cap screws these are the ones that are uh, recessed or uh, countersunk so these are designed to go flush with the application these are the ones that you measure from the top of the head to the end of the threads that's the whole length of that um, bolt or screw i'm sorry uh, for the screw is um, from the top of the head to the bottom of the screws and the angle of that head is 82 degrees off to the right you'll see this tool i just snipped that in there a few minutes ago before i started this to show this is a tool that's actually used to countersink your your metal uh, for the um, for the head to rest down inside of we have button head cap screws um, if you look the, the top of the head just looks just like a button um, they're pretty neat looking if you use those in certain applications um, they're they are used uh, with a an allen wrench to, to tighten or loosen the socket shoulder screws um, these are typically used as pivot points or axles uh, for parts that rotate around so the, only the threaded part right here is engaged into your part it bottoms out at the bottom of this shoulder or bottom of the the shank these are ground to certain tolerances so you'd have uh, maybe a wheel running on this section right here that's rolling around it uh, I've, used it, I've seen these a lot in applications where you've got pneumatic cylinders as they extend out they have to pivot just a little bit and as they extend and retract um, so pneumatic cylinders could be mounted onto those wheels different applications so here's just a, a slide showing you the different types of heads uh, head designs for screws um, most you'll you'll recognize or all these you should recognize the the phillips and the slotted those are the most common ones that are used uh, in this in this country at least um, here's some of the socket head cap screws we got the the normal socket head cap screw the low head cap screw the flat head um, socket head cap screw which is the the, the recessed countersunk and the button head and then the shoulder um, shoulder screw so set screws set screws are another fastening device these are used to lock pulleys and collars into place on the shafts and we'll use these when we get into i guess our shivs and our gears uh, these are locked on to shafts with uh, with set screws so all these uh, different types there know those for the test you've got a flat point half dog knurled oval point and soft tip and cone point so some of these uh, will damage the shaft when you tighten them down and some do not so that's the biggest difference in in application so like the flat point you can use those for frequent adjustments they, they do not damage the shaft um, like um, say the knurled would um, so you can loosen and tighten repetitively and not damage the shaft you got a better slide right here that shows what they actually look like so your flat point just what it is it's a flat point pushes down on the shaft 
I do minimal damage. The oval point is the same way. It's probably do less damage than the, the flat point. Cone point, now that's going to start pushing in the shaft and it's going to make a center point, center punch indention into your shaft. It's probably going to grip a little bit better. Your half dog, your half dog is actually, it doesn't tighten down on the shaft. You drill a hole in the shaft and that little point will go down inside of that hole of the shaft. So that's going to keep everything locked together. And you've got a soft tip which has a brass end. Notice down in the bottom right you have knurled. Those have like serrated uh, edges along the tip. Now that's definitely going to cut into the steel. No you in the steel shaft. When you tighten that down, you want to have a permanent um, permanent connection there. Uh, you can loosen it up and, and remove it, but then you're going to have damage to your shaft that you're going to have to file off. So here's a, another chart showing for set screws and the best application for those. You've got the type of set screws along the top row. And then the left column, you've got the application of strength. So vibration resistance. A uh, knurled cup is going to be best for vibration. The one that has the, um, the, the serrated edges. So vibration um, is going to be permanently hold parts. So if you look at the, the flat point, it's going to be good for readjustments. Good on thin wall material. Uh, act as a adjusting screw. But you know when it comes into permanently holding parts, it's, it doesn't uh, classify as a, a strong contender. So there's different applications for the different types of uh, set screws. So we'll look at the measuring the bolts and screws. We've already talked about, so we won't spend a lot of time here. Um, again, the if it's got a defined head that um, that that uh, contacts the top of the surface, you've got uh, you measure from the bottom of the head to the end of the the screw or end of the bolt. So if it's recessed, if it's countersunk in uh, the flat head cap screw, it's going to you're going to count the the head into the length because it's going to be recessed down into the part. And of course, your diameter is your bolt diameter or major diameter. Bolt length, bolt diameter. OK, bolt grades and classes. Now, this is talking about the hardness of the bolts. So there's some that are softer steel, some are hardened steel. Of course, the hardened steel is going to be a lot more expensive. And they're going to be more dense, be heavier. Um, so you want to pick your, your bolt for your application. You don't want to spend an outrageous lot of money on bolts you don't need that's um, grade 8 bolts. Your most common that you see are grade 5, which uh, is a really strong, uh, really strong bolt. Um, so look at the head markings on the, the chart there, about in the center of the, of the slide. We got a column there that says head marking. So if it has no marks on the top of it, and this is just talking about the, the, the standard bolts, um, unified unified thread system bolts in the top section. The bottom section is looking at metric. So if it has no markings on the head, it's a grade two bolt. It's a load medium carbon steel, and that shows your your strength there, your tensile strength before it breaks. Look at grade five. That's the next one down. It's got three tick marks on the head. So you have greater uh, tensile strength before it breaks. Then a grade eight is going to be, uh, will have six tick marks on the head. So I don't know how they came up with the, the number of tick marks versus the grade of the bolt, but notice that uh, there are two less. So a grade five, uh, two less than that is three tick marks. A grade eight, two less than that is six tick marks. If you look down to the metric, you've got uh, 8.8, 10.9, 12.9. .9. So the metric bolts are going to have a number stamped into the head. That's another way to identify a metric bolt. If it's got a number stamped on the head, that's a metric bolt. So a grade five 
is comparable to the 8.8 um, 8.8 classification bolt. The US recommended bolt torque table. So this chart is going to show us, um, you know, we used our torque wrenches in our first lab. So this is going to show us how much uh, torque is recommended for a certain grade of bolt or certain hardness of the bolt. So notice uh, at the top in the grade out section, you've got the, the second row, it's talking about the grade number. And then right below that in the third row, you've got coarse and fine. So grade two, coarse, fine, grade five, coarse, fine, and so on. On the left side, on the co left column, you've got the size or the diameter of the bolt. So let's come down to um, a quarter inch bolt. We can look at a, let's say a grade five quarter inch. The course is going to be a quarter 20. And then it's going to be 6.3 foot pounds of torque is what's recommended for a quarter inch, um, quarter inch coarse bolt. So the quarter inch fine bolt, as I mentioned earlier, they have greater bolt strength. So they're not as prone to break as, as easy. So you can go to a higher torque at 7.3. That's not a significant difference in that small of a bolt, but if you get down into um, so look down at the say a three quarter inch bolt. So we've got a grade five coarse bolt, three quarter inch. Our foot pounds of torque will be 200 foot pounds of torque for the coarse, and for the fine, it'll be 223 foot pounds of torque. That's how I use that chart. So here we've got uh, different types of nuts. Uh, just your Top left is your typical hex head nut, heavy hex jam nut. Uh, you got a, a cap nut or an acre nut. Those are going to go along with your carriage bolts. So as I mentioned, the swing set, instead of having uh, an exposed thread sticking out, they may use a cap screw. That way it, it tightens down onto the, the screw, tightens down into the swing set, but yet keeps the um, sharp end of the bolt or screw, I'm sorry, the sharp end of the bolt, keep it um, covered and not exposed as for safety reasons. So you have a wing nut. Those are just uh, used to tighten down with your fingers. And then notice on the, the two, next two, the slotted and castle, the one on the right, they got U uh, notches, U notches cut on each of the flats. How those work is um, they're not really designed for torquing down. Um, so we've got, these are often used on wheel bearings on cars so or on trailers. Um, how these work is you tighten them down, and there's a, a certain amount of tightness you want to put on to um, the tapered roller bearings for uh, a wheel bearing. But you don't want to over tighten them. If you over tighten them, then they're going to lock the bearing up. So you put just a little bit, have a little bit of movement in, and that amount of torque is not enough to hold that nut in place. So we need something to hold that nut in place. So what happens with these is there's a hole drilled into the shaft. And as you tighten that uh, slotted or the castle nut down, and you get it to your desired tightness, which is not going to be very tight, you get the desired tightness, and then you match up. One of those U holes, U notches, uh, to that hole that's in the shaft and put a cotter pin through it. So the cotter pin keeps the nut in place, keeps it from backing off, and that's basically its locking mechanism to lock it in place. Then the square nut just basically has four sides instead of six, like the hex. Uh, these are different locking um, locking devices. You've got the jam nuts. Uh, notice there, kind of the middle. I guess it's L and M um, example showing the cotter pin going through the castle nut. You've got lock washers, star washers. Those are used underneath nuts. Uh, more washers. 
There's a lot of different types of uh, washers, more than you probably realize. The top left is your common flat washer. Uh, you've got a third one down in the first column is spring lock washer. These are non-threaded fastening devices we'll talk about now. So dowel pins is a non-threaded fastening device. These are used to accurately position parts. They're not necessarily used to connect two parts together as far as you know clamping or tightening or for alignment. A really good example for that is like if you're putting heads onto your car engine. Typically they'll have dowel pins sticking up uh, to get everything lined up. So the dowel pins are sticking up, you put the head on that lock, that kind of sets it in place. And then you put your bolts in to tighten it. So there's a lot of different applications where dowel pins are used. Um, dowel pins can be used to permanently connect uh, parts together. Uh, a lot of times in wood applications, they'll use dowel pins and glue to, um, to tighten, you know, to put together. So you drill a hole in two pieces, put the glue on, put your dowel pin in, press, press fit really tight. Clamp it together until the glue dries. Makes a good connection. Um, you've got the, the straight, the tapered. Then you've got a, a roll or a split dowel pin. And that is a spring hardened dowel pin that will collapse just a little bit in diameter as it's pressed into a hole. Cotter pins is the second bullet. Uh, it shows a little picture there of the cotter pin. Um, it slides through a hole and then spreads out. Um, examples in the, the castle nut that we talked about earlier that you'd put that through. And then you just take some pliers. The part that's sticking out the other end, take some pliers and just curve it around to keep it from sliding back. It's a soft material, so it's it's not like it's a hardened steel. It's, uh, you just take some needle nose and uh, just curl the, the ends back. So the, the last bullet point is retaining rings, also called snap rings. You've got internal and external uh, snap rings. These are basically to keep parts from uh, slipping apart. And here's some pictures for that. The, the biggest picture there on the left is showing the internal snap ring. So you've got, a, say, a, barrel, a bearing that slides in. Then there's a notch that's milled into the the inside of that housing, and you use a pair of pliers, which is shown in the top right corner. You squeeze those, uh, notice those holes that's in the snap ring. You squeeze those together and bring the holes together. That makes the the diameter of that snap ring smaller, and then you can take it out, and you put it in the same way. You put it in, and then you release those um, pliers, makes the um, the snap ring, which is uh, a spring steel, and it makes it spring out, go back into the notch, and it holds it in place. A better view maybe is the external snap ring in the bottom right. It's a smaller picture, but that shows um, that it's there's a, a groove that's cut into that shaft. So you slide the gear on the shaft, and the groove will be exposed just right on the outside of the gear. You take a power pair of the snap ring pliers and on the external you actually spread it apart so notice the the picture of the the external snap ring you put your pliers in those holes and you actually spread it apart and it makes the inside diameter the id larger to slip down over the widest part of that shaft down to the knots and then you release your pliers and then the spring tension of that um, snap ring will enclose inside of that groove in the in the shaft and that uh, that locks that gear onto the shaft keeps it from coming off so we have keys uh, keys will fit down into a keyway of a shaft and into a keyway of a gear or a pulley so what you're doing is connecting um, you take a shiv and you slide it on the shaft and then you have a half notch into the sh shaft and half notch into the shiv into the pulley, and you put that key in between the two. So half of half of the key is going to be in the 
shaft, half of it's going to be in the pulley, and that's going to connect them together. It's going to keep the pulley from slipping on the, the shaft. And there's also another uh, good reason for that. They're, they're shear, shear keys. So if something locks up, say the motor locks up or whatever you're driving um, by the, the shiv or the or gearbox or the chain drive, if it locks up, something's going to give. If the chain's going to break, you're going to strip something out. Uh, so they, these are designed to where these shear off instead of making damage to the engine or your driven piece, driven equipment. So we've got different shapes. You've got the square key, which is the most common. That's what we'll use in our lab. You've got the jib key, which basically has a head on the end of it. It slides into the piece. You've got the head sticking out. You got the Woodruff key, which is a, like a half moon. Um, these really were popular with the Briggs and Stratton engines uh, back in the day, and it's really the only place I've ever seen them used. They're probably used in other places, but Briggs and Stratton was the big user of the Woodruff key. And your shaft is cut in that in that um, half moon pattern, so you've got a deep groove cut into your shaft. And the reason of that, those cannot actually dently come out the way they're grooved in. So if you're unfortunate enough to strip out threads in an internal um, internal threads in, in something, and I've, the most common places I've seen this used is where spark plugs in, a, in an engine have uh, stripped out in the head. So you can use a helical. Uh, these are to replace damaged internal threads. So if you strip out the threads, um, you could possibly repair it with the helical. You drill out uh, to a certain size and then uh, use a helical tool to uh, insert the helical um, threads into, into the, your internal thread system, wherever, whatever your application. So spark plugs where I've seen that used most. If you strip out, and that kind of saves your head. And if you're unlucky enough to break a bolt, I'm sorry, I break a tap off. So if you're you're uh, you're using a tap to cut some threads into a piece of metal, and then you you snap your tap off. Uh, taps are are hardened steel, so there's no indication, no no twisting, no bending of those they're so hard that when they go they go they, there's no warning sign it pops so a lot of times uh, the taps will break off down inside of parts and there is a tool that you can use to uh, remove those uh, these these are shown a standard uh, type of tap that has a four flues and the flues are used to kind of Extract the the chips. Remember, you you tighten it down to to a full turn and back it off a quarter quarter turn. What you're doing is breaking those chips, and they're coming out those flues, the the groove sides of that tap. So this tool is used uh, use the little fingers there, and you see the the picture with all the different parts. Those fingers are going to slide down inside of those uh, flues, and they're going to connect together under the holder have the sleeve come across it, and you can see the picture of the one that's put together on the top right. Um, you see how those all fit together, and then the, um, the holder, you can kind of slide it back and forth and um, have your fingers engaged down inside of the flues, and then use a tap handle or a crescent wrench or the correct wrench to fit the top of the holder to back out the tap. So this is just a picture of the board that we'll use in our lab. It has different types of fastening devices on it. Um, has some washers, nuts, bolts, some screws. So I'll give you a paper in our lab and we'll have different types of um, fastening devices that I want you to identify from this board, board and they've got numbers on it and that's how we'll uh, we'll do in our lab for the fastening devices. Okay, hope, that, hope this has been helpful. If you've got questions, feel free to uh, send me an email and I'll get back with you on that or jot down your question and we'll talk about it when we meet again in class, which will be, uh, I guess, in two weeks on the 19th, I believe.
So we'll meet for our, our live and our tests on that night. So hope everybody enjoyed this and holler at me if you got any questions. Take care.